welcome uh, everybody to the fourth uh, Middle East dialogue, which we are describing as a series of conversations with vital and varied perspectives on the conflict in Gaza, the United States' role in it, and the broader challenges and opportunities facing the Middle East as a whole. And there's probably no more vital perspective than that of our guest today, Dr. Salam Fayyad, who served as the Prime Minister of the Palestinian uh, National Authority from 2007 to 2013. In, in 2009, the New York Times columnist uh, Thomas Friedman coined the term Fayyadism uh, to refer to Dr. Fayyad's belief that, quote, an Arab leader's legitimacy should be based not on slogans or rejectionism or personality cults or security services, but on delivering transparent, accountable administration and services. Whenever anybody asks me what my religion is, I say Fayyadism. Uh, he is currently a visiting professor at- So you are fasting today. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we've been fasting since 2013. Um, um, uh, uh, Dr. Fayyad is currently a visiting professor at Princeton, and he is a senior fellow here at the Middle East Initiative. And, you know, throughout this series, uh, a, a lot of people have, have criticized me at various times for platforming this person or that person. And I always respond by saying, look, I'm not trying to platform anybody. I'm just trying to have uh, conversations and expose views. Um, but in this case, I'm totally platforming. Uh, uh, now, Dr. Samfayad does not need Tariq Masood to uh, platform him. But nonetheless, it's my great pleasure to do so, to bring his views to our audience. It's long been my belief that the world would be immeasurably better if we just listened to everything he said about everything. And I'm just saying this at the outset to be totally uh, transparent. I don't think I've ever disagreed with something Salam Fayyad said, or rather, when I've disagreed with it, I very quickly changed my view to conform uh, to it. So Dr. Uh, Fayyad and I are gonna talk for 45 minutes, uh, maybe an hour, and then we'll have uh, 30 minutes uh, for questions from the audience. We'll start with my students, but then open it up to everybody. Before we get started, I do want to note for everybody that the event is being recorded and will be uh, released on the internet, in this case, uh, fortunately. Um, and so it, when you ask a question, your voice and visage will be recorded for all time and eternity and beamed uh, throughout the known universe. So on, if you're uh, not comfortable with that, perhaps uh, you shouldn't ask a question, but hopefully you will be comfortable with that. Uh, the other thing I've been asked to do is read some text about possible uh, disturbances, but that's not going to happen, so I won't need to read the text. Um, before we get started, please join me in welcoming Dr. Salam Fayyar. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Salam. Thank you. So I wanted to start by talking about uh, Gaza and the military campaign there. Um, it began as a response to the terrorist attacks of October 7th, but now the response has cost more than 30,000 lives, and it's brought such untold human suffering that even friends of Israel are now entertaining the notion that what Benjamin Netanyahu and his right-wing allies are doing could be described as genocidal. You're in touch with people in Gaza on the ground. Can you describe the situation there for us? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Professor Masoud, for hosting me. Speaking of platforming, any platform is high for me. There is no higher platform. I'm honored to be with you, and thank you. Canada School Police Initiative and the audience for their interest. Yeah, sure, I'm in touch with people in Gaza from the very beginning. Uh, I always was, have been, uh, certainly after October 7th. And maybe a month and a half, maybe two months into this, just about anyone I talk to in, in, in Gaza either had lost someone to death or injury or knew someone who knew someone who had lost someone to death and injury. A recently released poll, uh, actually three, four days ago, the most recent poll issued by the Center for Policy Research and Analysis, Chicago's poll, 
found that 80% of the respondents from Gaza, 80%, said that they had lost a member or more of their family to death or injury. So this begins to tell you the story of how massive the scale of, of death and injury has been, uh, not to mention other aspects of misery when you know, livelihood became virtually impossible and continues to be, including famine and images that a lot of you have seen actually on, on television of people cooking during the month of Ramadan grass to eat. So for all the talk about humanitarian assistance and delivery thereof and the effort made and calls made to expand the scope of humanitarian relief, that continues to be the case as we speak. Especially early on, the massive bombing, bombardment, aerial from the sea, everywhere, and seeing people in the tents die and all. Uh, images, you know, you, we never really can move away from the images uh, of, of the death and destruction. Little kids, uh, some you see, uh, one in particular really stands out. Her name is Darlene talking about her family members, counting them one by one by one by one. She herself was, was injured. Just about the only member of family left alive. So this is how bad it is, to be honest with you. Certainly, and most immediately, our people in Gaza are suffering the most. But for the rest of us, myself included, it's, it's that deep sense of helplessness, maybe even deep sense of guilt about not being there to die with them. Really, this is how deep and personal this is for all of us. And I, it's the kind of thing that I'm sure it will stay with us for, for many, many generations to come. So for the reporting, people focus on numbers, 32,000 killed, more than 70,000, 80,000 people injured, many unaccounted for. And some, sometimes the numbers keep on being repeated to the point where people become desensitized to these stories as, as, as numbers. But, but the horror of it is, is massive. We know how this whole thing started, described as a, a war of response, but it surely did not take too long before it began to be seen as, and felt as a war of aggression. Um, and, and the victims are obviously, by and large, for the most part, civilians who have nothing to do with anything, and many of whom are women and children. Elderly, so that's that's kind of sketch of what comes to mind uh, as you ask the question. No, I, I appreciate that because I think it's important for us to just keep in view that when we are talking about the politics of this problem and how to solve it, that ultimately at the end of the day we are ta talking about a situation in which there is quite massive human suffering uh, ongoing. I, I wanted to get you to reflect a little bit on Gaza. So uh, a few weeks ago, six weeks ago, I hosted uh, uh, Jared Kushner here. And when I asked him about fears that Netanyahu might be trying to push Palestinians out of Gaza, he downplayed those fears. But he also said that Gaza was a construct. He said that it didn't have a historical precedent, precedent that it became a, a thing only after the 1948 war. And I, I didn't really... Um, uh, push on that line of inquiry, but can you describe what Gaza really is and what it means to Palestinians? Well, Gaza has always been an integral part of who we are, and, and certainly even more so after the peace process began. But history is, I mean, it's obvious that it's an integral part of who you are, both in terms of geography and people. Maybe not always politically, as everybody knows, uh, for the period between 1948 and 1967, it was under Egyptian administration as contrasted with Jordan, with, with the West Bank, which was a part of uh, Hashemite King of Jordan for the, that 19-year period. But after Oslo, with the promise it brought to Palestinians, I say promise, maybe expectation of statehood, it being noted that that was not really formally enshrined or even, some would say, I would say, even implied in Oslo. It became the expectation that the state of Palestine will actually be on the territory Israel occupied in 1967 in its entirety, including 
Gaza. Now, Gaza historically was uh, uh, the place where many, I mean, the, the Palestinian national movement, actually going back to the 50s of last century, was home to that, for sure. Uh, the first intifada in December 1987 actually erupted in Gaza. Uh, I could go on. I cannot really conceive for a minute, perceive a, a possibility, however remote, of there ever being a Palestinian state, if we're talking about a Palestinian state on the territory Israel occupied in 1967, if Gaza is not an integral part of that uh, uh, institution, that, that state. It's impossible, as a matter of fact. Uh, looking at it from Israel's point of view uh, in, in two ways. One, for those who for a long time wanted to see, in their own words, separation ahead of statehood, if that were to happen, Gaza was an important part of their presentation because their argument was made on the basis of demography. demography. The saying that we cannot be both democratic and Jewish at the same time. What they were really talking about is basically sheer numbers. And if you were to take Gaza outside demographic mix, that would make, at the time the conversation was taking place in the 90s, that intersection far removed into the future, for sure. So anyone, anybody who really wanted to see a Palestinian state that in the first instance had to respond to the aspirations of Palestinian people, but to the Israelis who also saw benefit to them in something like that happening, you know, the idea that Gaza was going to be outside the mix was something that was not conceivable. However, for those who were opposed to the idea of Palestinian statehood, separating Gaza from the entirety of Palestinian polity was absolutely important, because if you did that, you do exactly the opposite of what I have just said. You render it virtually impossible. If Palestinian statehood is going to emerge as a product of a consensual relationship and negotiations between Palestinians and Israelis. If you were to take Gaza outside of the mix, it becomes very difficult for those in Israel who would want to see Palestinian state. The case for it becomes a lot weaker. Mm. Now, for us Palestinians, we are one people. Uh, uh, relatives, uh, etc. Uh, I myself had a lot of uh, many personal experiences in Gaza. Uh, of course, I visited Gaza long before I was stationed there as Razrab on behalf of the IMF in late 1995. Uh, I lived there. Uh, I know the place very well. And, and I can tell you, I always had this premonition about Gaza separating. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought of it as different early on, you know, driving from Jerusalem, where I lived with my family, just about daily basis, and times I would overnight in Gaza, I would stay a few days. But as I went there, I had this feeling that this is, this is a state, why? Because in the West Bank, at the time there were settlements still in Gaza, there was the Israeli army still in Gaza, but not visible. You don't see them as you cross into the Gaza, into Gaza Strip from north to south. You don't see them unless you really drive way into Gaza. And, and they were separate somehow. But the minute you really entered there, you got this feeling that this is our. Somehow I felt, you know, I used to feel this way. Why? Because in the West Bank, driving in the West Bank, you saw the army everywhere. You saw the Israeli army, that is. But then a year or two into this, and particularly after the eruption of the Second Intifada and, and seeing all that was happening, I started to really think about this prospect of Palestinian statehood ever emerging as very much dependent on ensuring that Gaza and West Bank stay together. Mm. So around the time when the idea of this engagement of Gaza was tabled by, by Israelis, I got worried, you know, about what that might entail. And given the manner in which it was done, which was unilateral, not in negotiations with the Palestinians, with Palestinian Authority at the time. And there were many things, time for the deeper discussion into why I thought that good part of the design was to lead to at least a different Palestinian entity in Gaza. Mm. I know exactly what I'm talking about here, mm. for certain. Just to uh, give you a hint of what I'm talking about without getting into too much detail, as part of the discussion surrounding the disengagement, Israeli disengagement from Gaza, which was conducted at the time through the World Bank, I mean, we were involved, and I was a cabinet officer at the time, I was minister of finance at the time. I heard that 
the Israelis had suggested that as part of this engagement exercise, the trading arrangement between the Palestinian Authority and Israel was going to change in Gaza from the equivalent of the customs union. For those of you who are not into this literature, what we really talk about, one customs area, mm -hmm. to a free trade area, I asked, what about the West Bank? They said, no, only for Gaza. Mm. Now, you stop and think about that. Like, why, why is that? Why, why was that really even proposed? What defines a country? Mm. What as an entity? Security and trade regime. You cannot have a country with different trade regimes. Mm. So the idea was to at least minimally make of Gaza a different Palestinian entity mm. Mm. as a consequence or as a byproduct of that disengagement plan. It didn't work. But unfortunately, we kind of really hand-delivered it yeah. uh, in the form of what happened in, 19, in 2007, the violent takeover of power by Hamas in Gaza at the time, and we've been separate since then. Yeah. So to really get anywhere near a path that could lead us to deliverance at some point, under any scenario or plausible solution for this conflict, it is absolutely essential as an integral component of an empowerment strategy that we must embark upon sooner rather than later. Gaza must be reintegrated into our polity, must be reintegrated with the West Bank. It must be brought back into the fold. And I consider it a major failure of policy for that not having happened over so many years. And it became very, very compelling after October 7, and it could have really added an instrument of pressure to end the war sooner rather than later. Because to go to the Israelis and say, what about the day after the Palestinian Authority is ready to assume responsibility for the affairs of Palestinian people in Gaza would have added and still could add to the instruments of influence that could be deployed to bring this war of aggression to an end today before tomorrow. So, so, Dr. Salem, there's a, there's a lot of threads for us to pull on here, but the one I, I want to focus on uh, now is the one you just raised, which is that, you know, the key, part of the key towards a, a settlement to this problem is there being a reunification of the Absolutely. Palestinian camp that was cleaved in, in 2007. And you said that is a major failure. Whose failure is it? Oh, I think uh, a good part of our history cannot be explained without looking at us through the prism of what factional rivalries uh, did to us, uh, most devastating. And this is not new, and it predated, actually, Hamas. Hamas came into being in 1987. But factional rivalries, both you know, between factions and within factions, actually have been a, a, a chief characteristic of our national movement. Uh, it's about we were without representation, as everybody knows. And it was not before the PLO became recognized as our sole legitimate representative that the question started to be settled. Mm -hmm. And it started out with some Arab countries, Muslim countries, et cetera, and so on and so forth, little by, until we got to the point to 1993, where it became so recognized by everyone, including uh, the state of Israel. So when you have uh, people who are not looked at uh, through uh, a, 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 a political entity that is seen as its representative, people vying, factions vying for that representation uh, uh, engage in, in, uh, in, in rivalries that I, I think were very, very damaging. And uh, What's this rivalry about, the rivalry between Hamas and Fatah? What is it at root about? Is it at root about different visions for, for Palestine? It can, you know, one can look at it that way, for sure. There are different ideologies. And by the way, even before Hamas came into being, uh, there were differences within the PLO actually within certain factions within the PLO itself as to what might constitute an acceptable solution uh, to us Palestinians. Mm -hmm. uh, within, within Fatah itself, between Fatah and the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, for example, ours is not a history of high degree of consensus or accord, except possibly for the period between 1988 and 1993. That was a remarkable period of national consensus 
following the speech given by our late leader Yasser Arafat in Algiers in November of 1988, when he stood up before the Palestinian National Council, saying in, in the name of God, in the name of the Arab Palestinian people, the Palestinian National Council hereby declares the state of Palestine. He uh, mm. translating. Mm. Now everybody in the council, hundreds of delegates, stood up in tears, cheering and all, including those who were opposed to the idea of accepting anything less than all of the land that we consider our ancestral land, that's Palestine. Mm -hmm. It was not until the day after that some actually realized that the flip side of that statement, given that it was made alongside consideration what was called Palestinian Peace Initiative, which accepted UN Security Council Resolution 242 in particular, that, that actually meant a state on the territory of Israel occupied in 1967, that some within the PLO uh, realize, oh, uh, what have we agreed to? Mm -hmm. uh, some dissent, but not that much dissent. Uh, you know, the speech was very well received yeah. and people were very much into this. And for that five year period, there was a remarkable degree of convergence within body politic in, in Palestine. Hamas was there by that time, yeah. but at the time Hamas was not pulling more than 10%. Uh, so there was, great deal of support for the idea up until the signing of the Oslo Accord in 1993. At that point, there was a fracture. Definitely at that point, there was a fracture because there's a difference between what people thought they might get out of the 1988 transformation and what Oslo promised. With some, particularly some thinkers, most notably Edward Said, for example, yeah. writing only one month after Oslo was signed. Yeah. You know, how weak that was and how little it brought with it by way of recognition of any of our national rights. And that turned out to be, prophetically, for sure at the time he said it, it turned out to be really Achilles heel of the agreements. Because when you really look at what was written and what was agreed to, there's absolutely nothing in there yeah. that actually was about a solid promise of Palestinian statehood. It was something that we Palestinians kind of hoped we would get out of it, yeah. particularly given the enormity of the concession yeah. relative to our own historical narrative. We felt was made in 1988, our leadership felt, well, it's a done deal for sure, having yeah. made this huge concession, for sure we're going to get the The concession state. being recognizing Israel's right to exist. And beyond that, what came with it, yeah. relative to our own historical narrative, that yeah. meant at most accepting a state on only 22% of land that we consider our ancestral land, for sure, relative to our own narrative. Yeah. So that, the enormity of that concession as seen by Palestinians at the time, led some to believe that for sure we're going to get the 22%. We're asking for the 100%. All we're looking for is 22%, for sure it's going to happen. On the strength of the goodwill that the signing of the accords brought with it, the international community's desire to see it happen, the Etc. So there, there was that, but then it didn't take too long before the promise of Oslo right. really started to falter. So, so, so you know how we got onto this topic is you know as as you pointed out that one of the real problems facing the Palestinians and part of the reason that the Palestinians have not been able to effectively uh, um, uh, represent themselves and affect and 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 and. Uh, and one of the reasons maybe that we don't have a ceasefire yet is because of the split within the Palestinian camp, that a prerequisite to a solution is there has to be unification in the Palestinian camp. And then the question was, why is there this split in the Palestinian camp, factional rivalries? What are these factional rivalries about? And now you've painted a picture for us where the factional rivalry is really about one faction that says, Let's accept uh, Israel on, uh, you know, within the 1967 borders and another faction that says what? That, well, we tried that and it didn't work? And, and is that how we're supposed to understand uh, Hamas? That's part of the explanation. Uh, there have been always competing visions uh, and, and, and those predated Hamas, as I said. Yeah. But the rivalry was not really, it was about representation, as I said, with the focus being a lot more on the privilege of representation 
what came with representation by way of privilege, mm. not responsibility, mm. not enough attention to what comes with the right to represent when you are so recognized, what comes with it by way of responsibility. Here we come to the point about vision. What is this program about? What, what, is it, what is the essence of this movement? What is it about? It's about deliverance. It's about freedom for our people. It's about our people at some point getting to the point where they're able to enjoy that which is a natural right for all peoples around the world, exercise their right to self-determination, including the right to be able to live as free people with dignity in a country of our own. How much of that was the driving force behind the differences of view and the rivalries? Hmm. Could explain some of it, but not necessarily all of it. Hmm. Uh, I, uh, I'm afraid, uh, you know, that only tells part of the story. That only tells part of the story. Because if it were only about vision, if it's only about vision, there's a lot that can be said. First of all, if the bet that was made on Oslo by the PLO in 1993 panned out, for sure, all what we're really talking about would be just in the nature of an academic mm -hmm. conversation basically reflecting on what could have happened relative to what actually happened. You know, something like that. Because the bet that was made succeeded, if it did succeed. Yeah. It didn't. And that's really what opened the Pandora's box for all kinds of real questions and possibilities. Because that bet failed, it made it possible for Hamas to build on the support that it had by people who were aligned with its values, you know, given its Islamist, you know, tendencies and character and all of that. You add to that all of those people who really saw in Oslo a betrayal, certainly legitimately so because of its failure to deliver on what they thought would come from Oslo. So unfortunately, what, what really exposed us, so to speak, is the failure. So had the bet worked out, you know, this would have been, you know, an academic exercise conversation about what could have happened, what might have happened, et cetera, et cetera. And a, a bet made by the PLO succeeding would have meant by now, long time ago, a, a state. And all of this would be uh, just, just a conversation. But it didn't. So you, you have to factor, then you have to ask question, like, why did that not happen? Yeah. Why did that not happen? All we have really said about, all we have talked about so far is our own failures. And I'm someone who is really not at all shy to begin any conversation when it comes to issues as important as August, as freedom for your people, than beginning with asking a question what our own responsibility is mm. in that endeavor before I look at anyone else. Yeah. But this is not to absolve Israel or other you know, players from you know, uh, the, the failure, uh, failure to deliver, failure to act when they could have and should have acted uh, consistent with what needed to happen to produce the outcome that we all were looking for. Yeah. But this, the history on this is long. Yeah. It didn't take too long before, as a matter of fact, what, what was thought to be yeah, maybe a rocky period of five years leading to statehood at the end by May of 1999, you didn't quite pan out that way, and, and one, one episode you know, uh, of, of uh, disappointment and failure turned to another yeah. until the eruption of the Second Intifada, then you know, everything appeared at the time to have unraveled. A little bit of promise, maybe a few years later, but then again, here we go, uh, there we go again. It is not really only us that we're playing here. Yeah. I put my, myself, if you allow me to say this, uh, looking both at what is in Oslo itself. And the directives given to the negotiating team that actually negotiate Oslo on the part of Israelis. And I'm not quoting anyone here, but the record is there for anyone who wants to really go and look at it. But as academics, I invite you, as a matter of fact, to really study the agreements themselves and, and, and see if there is not plausibility to what I'm about to suggest to you. The agreements as they are written and, and structured, it's not a coincidence that they are not explicit on Palestinian statehood. Because the directive given to the Israeli negotiating team was make statehood a possibility, but not necessarily the outcome. It was an autonomy. It was self-rule. It was, Palestinian authority was supposed to be a self-rule 
for a transitional period that was to culminate an agreement on permanent status issues, not, not statehood or anything like that. That self-rule agreement or arrangement enshrined in Oslo was a chapter in the Camp David Accord between Egypt and Israel, which Palestinians did not accept at the time. And the legal team on the Israeli side that wrote that part in the, in the Camp David Accord with Egypt was the same legal team that produced the Oslo Accords. So that was there. Yeah. It's obvious. The speech that was given by late Prime Minister Rabin to the Knesset one month before as he was assassinated, he presented his own vision to Knesset about what that Palestinian state was going to be like or not like. And essentially, what he said, without really repeating you know, the, the entire text, and it's written, anyone can really actually Google it, essentially what he talked about was a, a state of leftovers, essentially. A state of leftovers of the West Bank. That, that's basically what we'll he, talk he about. He said something less than a state. Exactly. I think was his exact it, exactly. Wording. There yeah. was a question for a period of time as to whether that represented Rabin's views himself. Yeah. Or was it something that he felt he had to say in order to win approval by the Knesset for the Oslo Accords? That was in 1995. I'm not going to really go more into this, but the fact of matter, the, the fact that he felt he had to give that speech, regardless of whether or not he believed it, yeah. suggested to me that even then, not today, yeah. not the current government of Israel, even then, the center of gravity of the body politic in Israel was not accepting the idea of Palestinian sovereignty anywhere on the territory between River Jordan and the Mediterranean. So that, that, that's, that's, that's basically the design. So if you really take it from there, something extraordinary should have happened by way of transformation to produce Palestinian statehood, and, and that didn't happen. But, but, but the point that you're, you're making here yeah. is you're saying, you know, yes, the Palestinian leadership deserves uh, tremendous blame for allowing these factional rivalries to prevent us from effectively uh, uh, working on behalf of statehood. But you are also saying that doesn't absolve the Israelis of oh. the fact that they were never really into the idea that we would get our own state. That's, am I correct in understanding you that way? I think that's fair characterization yeah. of what I yeah. said, for sure. So, so I want to, I wanna, you know, uh, get to a few more questions and then I want to open it up. And sure. we, uh, we've, I've already consumed a, a lot of our time. So I'm going to ask you to be uh, a little bit sure. uh, more laconic. But, um, you know, I want to talk about Hamas. Yeah. This entity called Hamas, we've been talking about it a lot. You may have seen uh, uh, David Brooks's column in the New York Times uh, recently where he said, look, if this war ends with a large chunk of Hamas in place, that would be a disaster. And that you, and yet you have actually said, no, the way out of this is that there has to be some kind of national unity government, presumably, which would involve Hamas. So what is David Brooks getting wrong here? A lot, in, in my view, uh, beginning with uh, the fact that somehow when it comes to us, what is considered to be a virtue just about everywhere in the world is, is somehow something we should not even consider, contemplate, or think is appropriate way of managing our own affairs. How about like a pluralism? You teach the importance of pluralism and everybody's talking about the, the virtues of it, except that when it knocks on our door, Palestinians, somehow we really need to be monolithic. Everybody has to be like everyone else. And everybody has to really say we agree with us or nothing else in order for us to somehow uh, audition for membership in uh, uh, like society. Know, something, yeah. something like that. We like all people around the world. Uh, we're, we, we're Palestinians, yes, but we are of different persuasions, background, beliefs, and, and all of that. Challenge for any society to be successful is to find a way to manage that, that pluralism. Manage it effectively, not, not to suppress it. If anything, you should encourage it. But, but the challenge is to find a, an effective way to manage it. And especially difficult for us, given the history, given the context in which we are evolving and developing. Uh, this, was not, this is not uniquely Palestinian, but it's made so in, in particular, because we are under occupation, because of the history, because effectively it had to involve Israel giving up something. So it was really com not completely up to us in, 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 in important ways. So 
That's the first mistake that people make. It's like, oh, the best way to really deal with this, if somehow we get rid of Hamas and like-minded factions, we, we have a solution. Well, first of all, Hamas was not really much of a force to be reckoned with in 1993 when Oslo Accords were signed. And, you know, PLO came into being, PA was established, and, and the rest of it. And had Oslo succeeded in delivering on promise of status for Palestinians, history would, you know, we'd be living in a different world together. But so, part of the reason, uh, sorry yeah, not to interrupt yeah, you, but yeah. I, 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 an Israeli might say part of the reason that Oslo failed was because Hamas and other groups like it engaged in acts of terror that made the Israelis think this is not going to be a workable solution. Look, I know they say that, yeah. and I know, as a matter of fact, it's no, no secret that, that uh, I saw once myself a, a Hamas uh, a member of leadership, not, not exactly Politburo, but I, uh, I forgot what his rank was at the time, taking credit for, as a matter of fact, having worked hard in order to derail Oslo. But on the Israeli side, guess who ran on a platform to annul Oslo completely, cancel it and all? Someone by the name Benjamin Netanyahu. His first run at premiership was in May of 1996. And his campaign was about doing away with Oslo. That was in 1996 himself. And, and he, this is all bogus, it shouldn't be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a, this is a debate. I think we you know, can talk about it uh, and how Israel views and project, it projected security as paramount component of what really wanted to accomplish out of this. But it's Israelis who really would insist on making that point and not really look at the other side of the equation would be hard pressed to explain why it is that when security conditions in the West Bank improved markedly for about four to five years, with violence declined to the virtually nothing in the aftermath of the Second Intifada, they did nothing to change their security policies in the West Bank. They did not stop sending the troops into so-called Area A, meaning urban areas of the West Bank when they could have. They used to say, we have to do this because Palestinians are not taking care of security. Look at what happened, Intifada and all of that. So if security is established in West Bank, if the Palestinian Authority proves it can do this for sure, we will no longer be sending the troops into the cities of West Bank as was required under Oslo, something which they departed from in the spring of 2002. So the, the expectation was that if security were to improve, they would stop doing this. Guess what happened? Yeah. Security by all measures and indications, yeah. including international observers, Israelis themselves, yeah. acknowledged the vast improvement security, and they resisted any, they rejected even ha having any conversations about stopping the incursion. I don't want to really cite names of people here, whether they are former officials or anything like that, it's not good protocol. But I myself was told by Israeli officials, I'm not going to name them. Yeah. If what you're really talking about is the return to September 28 positions, and that's a reference to the date on which the Second Intifada erupted, yeah. don't think about it because Israel will always and forever be in charge of security in the West Bank. Yeah. I myself was told that in the first meeting I had with a senior Israeli official yeah. after I became prime minister, at which point I said, all right, salamu alaikum. <laughs> uh, uh, if that is the case, take it, occupy it, yeah. Manage it, do everything. Yeah. Uh, and what happened, as a matter of fact, things worked out, security was improved, and all I was asking for, meeting after meeting after meeting, deploying all kinds of you know, diplomacy through the United States, everyone else wanted to listen. The one thing that we needed more than anything else, in addition, of course, to stopping settlement activity, was to get Israel to stop sending the troops into the cities of West Bank, yeah. because that would signal to people that what we're doing was consistent with the idea of getting to statehood. Yeah. Because people then would see that actually what we're talking about is not only an exercise in improving their livelihood, which is essential under any conditions, but actually it was going to deliver on the promise of us being able to live as free people in country. In Without integrity. Israeli tr Exactly. So, so and they didn't. So, so they, if, if they say Hamas kind of really spoiled it, yeah. 
Yeah. I think they did enough spoiling themselves. Yeah. I'll tell you that. Fair, fair, fair enough. But yeah. just, to, just to, to talk about Hamas briefly. So when the, the, the question I asked was about, um, you know, David Brooks's proposition that including Hamas would be catastrophic, that Hamas needs to be eradicated. I'm assuming your position is that Hamas can't be eradicated and that it is a, a valid or legitimate part of the Palestinian body politic. And, and I guess the, the other thing that I know you to believe is that nonviolence is a, yes. be a non-negotiable, it's a rock-bottom commitment I know of yours. So how do you square that with the idea of Hamas being a, a legitimate part of the Palestinian body politic that needs to be at the table? Yeah, you know, the PLO itself was about armed struggle, uh, so-called contemporary Palestinian revolution, you know, started out as uh, an armed resistance. Uh, long before there was any conversation about negotiations or anything like that. I mean, the idea of diplomacy within Palestinian ranks to get a state on part of Palestine started to kind of be considered within the PLO in the mid-70s. Yeah. But before that, I mean, I was talking about armed, armed struggle yeah. and, uh, and all. So this is not exactly new to think, eh? and it's not the first Your step. idea is that, the, sorry, yeah. forgive me, yeah. your idea is that the transformation that the PLO underwent is one that Hamas could undergo if they were brought into some kind of political process? That's possible, it's, it has not been tested. Yeah. It, it happened, all we know, it happened. Yeah. We, we know it happened in the form of the PLO having undertaken, having gone through that kind of retransformation. It happened before. So whether or not that could happen again is something else, but then, as a practical matter, you look at what is doable. Mm -hmm. You know, to start the conversation by saying, you know, we need to eliminate these forces and factions before something like uh, they call them spoilers to to kind of really deal with the spoilers, uh, as if it's really something that is totally under control to kind of exclude somebody. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about ideologies and political movements, I think it's just totally wrong to speak in those terms to begin with. Mm -hmm. Hamas is not, Hamas is a political movement, it's an ideology, so therefore it cannot be destroyed, for sure, I mean, the idea. Uh, so starting the war in, you know, under that objective of eradicating, eliminating Hamas and all of that, and even objectives stated by Israel subsequently, the when I say Israel, I mean government of Israel, uh, repeatedly, if it's not this objective, if you actually go through this, these uh, war objectives as enunciated by the government of Israel, they all, in my humble opinion, range from the impossible to the highly unattainable. Mm. Uh, and, and ideologies cannot, you, you, can't, you, you can't destroy ideologies. You can't defeat them with, with the more competitive yeah. ideologies, something that really appeals to people. Yeah. My ideas involve going back to the people at some point, yeah. elections, through a transitional period. You cannot get Hamas or Islamic Jihad, we're not talking about them, yeah. or others within Palestinian body politic, who still believe in, in armed struggle and all of that, uh, and there are more of them today than, than there were before. Um, but what you can get them to agree to is commitment to nonviolence uh, during transitional period, for example. I mean, you do, you go for what you can get. Yeah. That's something I would expect. Could you spell this, this proposal out? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, to move from A to C, you need to yeah. get cover the period between A to B now, yeah. you know. So to move from where we are to where we need to be, going to people and having people elect their representatives and, and government, which is not practical in, in, in the here and now, but it must at some point, you need to go through a certain transition. My proposal was to actually expand the PLO to include those excluded from it so far, like Hamas, like Islamic Jihad, and all of that. And to have the expanded PLO consent to a government that's non-factional, does not have on it Hamas, Jihad, or... Technocrats. Yeah, for a transitional period, multi-year transitional period, tasked with managing the affairs of Palestinian people, both in Gaza and the West Bank, during which time there is an ironclad commitment to nonviolence by everyone. During the transitional period? Yes, everywhere. Everyone, that, that's acceptable. Hamas would accept that. Hamas was dealing on that basis with Israel before, uh, through Egypt, through others, etc. Uh, understandings uh, of, of that kind. So that's doable. And then to have elections at the end of that transitional period, date certain for which would be announced at the start of the transitional period. That's the kind of 
we, we, transition, I was really thinking about it at yeah. the time. But back to something you said about non I could hear, sorry, yeah. forgive me, I could yeah. hear an Israeli saying, yeah. Well, at the end of this transitional period, where the, you know uh, you, you you'll have the election and uh, Hamas will win the election, and then we're back but, where we started. Well, well look, uh, they can say that, and oh, would they be right? You know, they, they could be right, but I would say, look who's talking. Uh, if some somebody were to say that, uh, look at the government uh, that Israel currently has. Uh, I mean, I I, I wonder. I, I'm really serious about this. Israel has in its ranks now, in its government, cabinet officers who are on record not only opposing the idea or concept of Palestinian statehood, but even the feeble Palestinian authority, which is a self-rule body. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's what we're really talking about. Cabinet officers sitting on the current government of Israel saying we Palestinians have one of three choices, either conform to whatever this oppressive occupation wants us to really do or whatever, conform and live and, and accept it as it is. Um, leave, that's another option. And if you choose to resist, you're, you, you're, you're killed. Mm. So that's a government that Israeli elections produced. You see what I'm saying? So what I'm really saying is let this process run its course. Let us so we'll have go through this process. So we'll have two extremist elected yeah. governments. Look, if, if that were to happen, if that's to happen, we, we, that's better than where we are right now. Right now, we, we have not had elections in a very long period of time. The fact that we could have that an outcome should not stop us from having elections. And when we do have elections, that should be in inclusive and everybody should be invited. My own sense is, if in fact, we go through the transition that I'm talking to you about, yeah. if people really get enough of a chance to look at an alternative yeah. and what, what could be possible, and re regenerate sense of possibility yeah. about Palestinian statehood and all of that, uh, there is also a distinct possibility that elections could produce a different outcome. So, so you wanted to say something up quickly about nonviolence, yeah. and I interrupted yeah. you. And no, then no, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, you, you said something about my own position. Yeah. That's something I wholeheartedly believe in. It, not only because it beats the alternative, in, in my view. Nonviolence has an deeply intrinsic, immense uh, inner strength and, and, and value to it that is vastly underappreciated. And I really think it's, it's the one platform that we should stand on and it's the one that really can deliver us if we really actually focus on developing a strategy of self-empowerment. Yeah. One that is actually based on the notion that freedom is not given to us. We will it. We were free because we will to be free, not because we're waiting for Israel to really give us that. You start with that, and you really begin to ask your questions, what is really the most important thing for us to do to ensure that our people are, are continue to be able to stand the adversity of occupation, yeah. live in the face of the occupation, confront the occupation by insisting on projecting the reality of that state that we want yeah. on the ground, in spite of the occupation on the way to ending it. Yes. That's what I really believe in. Right. A, a strategy like this, underpinned by total commitment to nonviolence, resistance by existing, yes. resistance by existence, yes. resistance by insisting or projecting the reality of the state that you say you want. Yes. That, that's really what I believe in. So I, I want to get to that, and, and I think one, the way we can do this is in a, a kind of... Um, I, I want to put to you a few propositions sure. that have, we have heard, some of which we've heard on this uh, 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 stage about the conflict, and I, I want to get your reactions, your, br your brief reactions to them. So the first uh, uh, proposition we've heard is uh, this war could end right now if Hamas would just release the hostages. Have you said brief? Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Because I have a... Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, 10 minutes, I, I had yeah, yeah. Uh, 10 minutes. Okay, look, uh, that, that's been said uh, from the very beginning, yeah. uh, I, I remind you. I myself actually called for the immediate and unconditional yes. release of all civilians, days into this. And that should have happened. Hamas said that they were prepared to do something like this if they were assured that they could have safe passage and something like that. It didn't happen, then we went through these negotiations and all of that sort of thing. Now it has become uh, 
a part of the expectation that if there is going to be a release of hostages, there's going to be a release of Palestinian prisoners as well. Mm -hmm. Those discussions have gone through some difficulties as of, uh, the, over the past few weeks. I hope that, among other things, the resolution that was passed by the Security Council on calling for immediate uh, ceasefire yes. and the use of hostages would rekindle interest in those negotiations and lead to the release of hostages in the way that could happen realistically. Okay. Uh, the s second proposition that we've heard here is Hamas could have turned Gaza into a Singapore, but instead it chose to invest in rockets and tunnels. Well, first of all, there are not many Singapores around the world. That, that, that's, that's a high bar. And, well, and the, leave that. Yeah, it could have yeah, turned it yeah, into something better. The, the, yeah. That's a high bar under the best conditions. And yeah. conditions in Gaza were, are, are, are kind of really far removed from being ideal conditions, under which you can really create that kind of reality. Gaza, uh, also the West Bank, uh, you know, there are some who say Gaza has been under siege since 2007. Gaza has been under siege for a much longer period of time. It's very difficult to see how you can bring about sustainable economic development and prosperity under those conditions of siege and restrictions and all. But even minus that, the, 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 the economic development is not an easy undertaking, even under steady state conditions. Uh, when, when you have this kind of instability, wars, incursions, uh, rounds of escalation one, one after another, uh, no freedom of movement to people and goods and, and all of that. How are you going to really bring about even modest uh, economic development, much less the success that Singapore has been? So, and then I, I would have to say, uh, the idea that somehow, uh, if only we were to find a way to get people busy, make a better living, uh, and all that they somehow would forget about you, the importance or value to them of living as free people in a country of their own would dissipate, would go away, become less important. It, it, it simply doesn't work. Uh, oh, but so it's my, Fayyadism. What I'm saying no, is but, but, uh, if, if Salem Fayyad uh, had been in charge of, of Gaza, you wouldn't have oh, governed it in I, exactly the same way that, the, I, that Hamas did. I tell you, where, where I'm different uh, on this is I believe that economic development can be designed yeah. uh, in a way that would serve the dual purpose of, on the one hand, doing the necessary, because what is it that you're really doing when you invest in education, when you invest in, 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 in better health care and all of that sort of thing? You're investing in your own people. I mean, that's, that ought to be the first and most immediate goal of development, any sensible, rational development strategy, that's what it is. But in our case, yeah. it would serve this other important purpose of establishing yes. you know, the, the, the imperative of this really turning into the independent political entity that we want it to be. In other words, do the necessary, because it's necessary, but on the strength of succeeding on doing that, yeah. you gain the sovereignty Is that, that you want. not an option for Hamas in Gaza? <laughs> I, I don't know if they really thought about this way. I can tell you I, I thought this way, but I, yes. but I failed. <laughs> well, well, okay, so, so... Yeah, I failed. I mean, it, it didn't work. There are many reasons why it didn't work, but that's, that's basically what I was betting on. So a lot of people took issue. You know, it's like, oh, so what are you doing? Building roads and things like this, schools, but we are under occupation. I'd say necessary to do, yeah. because to end the occupation means as a first step toward that is to ensure that you're going to be able to withstand the adversity of living under occupation, to get to the point where we, where we are stayed. So when the political end was not delivered on, that basically was exposed as nothing more than exercise and what Netanyahu calls economic peace. Yeah. And economic peace is not going to wash. Okay. Uh, so so the, other, the other proposition that you always hear is Palestinians could have had a state, but they walked away from every deal that would have given it to them. Yeah, it's, it's a saying that's often repeated that we do not miss an opportunity to, to miss one. You know, Camp we, David, yeah, we, Albert, you know. Uh, we we failed because we keep on saying no 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 no. Uh, I'm here to tell you we did not fare too well on in countless times we said yes either. So there must be some other reason. That's why okay. I accept I accept this as an element 
in a bigger conversation, in a, in a longer list. Yes. But to really say we failed on, because of this, I think it's a little unfair. Okay. An another proposition that we often hear, I hear this a lot from Israeli uh, friends of mine when they know that I spend some time with you. They say, oh, if the Palestinians only had leaders like Salam Fayyad, this entire problem would have been solved already. That's an oversimplification. Yeah. <laughs> Gross oversimplification. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, my, my question to them is, what did you do when you had a leader like Salam yeah. Fayyad, who was prime minister yeah. for six years? <laughs> I just mentioned to you one factor, as a yeah. matter of fact. It could have made a difference. Uh, it really could have made a difference. Because uh, you, you always look at, you describe me as a technocrat or, or something. But the minute you join the government as a cabinet officer, even before you're prime minister or anything like that, you can't say you're just a technocrat. You can't say, well, I'm just an accountant. Well, I'm just like fixing this and, and all of that. You, you have to project the, the entity you serve on. You, 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 you're a politician. You're, you're not a full-time politician. You have a trade, et cetera. Yes, that's for sure. But um, the fact of the matter, there is a, 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 a game of politics that needs to be played. And I can tell you for sure, it's something I understand. They were detractors. They were detractors because there were a lot of people invested in the prevailing status quo at the time. And that cut against the grain. So it was expected. So I can't just like, oh, oh what's going on? Why can't really see the wisdom mm. of what I see? You can't really have that kind of attitude. You just really need to accept that you could be wrong and engage in debate and conversations with people. But what's really banking on is to prove beyond any doubt to the detractors, to the skeptics, and there were many actually mm -hmm. in the ranks of academics, intellectuals, and all, I'm not really talking to you, who really actually from the very beginning were saying, this is really absolutely naive. How do you think you can ever, you know, build the state under occupation, all of that sort of thing, just like that. Some thought it made too much sense. Some thought it made enough sense. They were kind of really maybe, you know, Maybe someone, someone else should have thought about this. It's so obvious. I don't know. So you engage in these kinds of conversations. And I used to, mm -hmm. in the most open of ways, with media people, with um, the students, with, with everyone else. And the knock on this was always that it's impossible to do under occupation. And how can you really prove them wrong? Only if, in fact, it had delivered on what could have begun, begun to suggest to people that statehood is on the horizon. And the one thing that could have made the difference yeah. was if, in fact, we could have rolled the Israeli presence in a military sense in the West Bank to what it was up until September 28, 2000. If that had happened, then you could have said, see, it's not really only about improving livelihood and living conditions, but this whole strategy, including the component of nonviolence of it, yeah. it, it actually rests on it importantly can lead to statehood because when people begin to see their own security as opposed to the Israeli army, yeah. that begins to really conjure up images of sovereignty of their own presence. It was not a coincidence, therefore, that not only was I asking for the Israeli army to stop sending the troops into so-called area A or urban areas, but actually to begin to have Palestinian security presence in area C, in villages, yeah. in, in rural areas, modest, I mean, I understand the difficulty, in a modest way, so people could, could see their own security as opposed to the Israeli army. Things like this would have made a difference. Yeah, yeah. And, and they were not done. Yeah. Uh, so regardless of what is told about this great experiment and all of that sort of thing, I think in practice, very little was done to support it. And I would argue that actually in many ways, uh, actions were taken it, that contributed to its demise politically. Okay, so, so that, uh, the last one, and then I'm gonna open it up, is you, you hear this from a lot of Americans who will say, oh, if only Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin had not been assassinated by a Jewish extremist in 1995, this problem would have been solved already. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of people who would believe that, and God knows what would have happened had, had the process continued. Uh, I just cited to you what he, what, what, um, what he said in 1995, one month before he was assassinated. Now, did he really actually mean it? Uh, if he did, um, God knows how much longer he would have stayed as prime minister anyway, right. but we know what happened after uh, he, he died. So again, uh, I think there's just so much resistance to the idea 
of Palestinian statehood or any anything sovereign other than Israel's sovereignty yeah. in the territory, to where I'm really skeptical about that. I'm not really saying, you know, statehood could not have happened under any condition. I'm not really saying this was doomed. But a lot of things had to really have, a lot of things had to happen in a vastly different way to produce that outcome. In other words, the deck was stacked against the possibility of a statehood. Yeah. So a lot of things had to happen right yeah. on all sides to prove everybody wrong. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the way the agreement itself was structured, in the way Israel was not ready to accept a Palestinian state alongside it, and, and this is deep, and it became a lot deeper over time to where we are right now. Uh, people say two-state solution without defining it. Uh, you know, Jared Kushner was here, and he had a hand in, in, in putting together the famous Trump plan and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. And that can also, I mean, in a technical sense, that's a, that's a two-state solution. Yeah. But but is it a kind of state that Palestinians can really, yeah. you know, find acceptable? Obviously not. Yeah. But by the way, I just say this in passing, since we mentioned the assassination of, uh, of Prime Minister Rabin. By the way, if you look at what was presented by uh, uh, Donald Trump in 2000, January 2020, that plan, and what that speech by Rabin implied yeah. in 1995, you would find them virtually completely the same. Why? I mean, on, on two key issues, on question of territory and on question of sovereignty. Because on territory, in the Rabin speech of 1995, he said that, First of all, the settlements, in the way he referred to them in the speech, are going to be under Israeli sovereignty. We'll talk about the West Bank, settlement West Bank. They're going to be under Israeli sovereignty. That, you know, uh, security was going to be, you know, Israel will have security in the Jordan Valley, defined in the broadest possible sense of the word. Yeah. Jordan Valley constitutes about 25% of the landmass of the West Bank. And so you add 25% to the area of settlements, that's about 30%, maybe a little bit more. How much did the Trump plan offer the Palestinians for, uh, out of the West Bank? 70%. Yeah. So, so on, on territory, it's very comparable. Yeah. So it's, the map appears to have been the same, more or less. Now, on sovereignty, you, you quoted Rabin as having said something minus, uh, state, state. state minus. Uh, Trump plan did not have Palestinian sovereignty in it uh, at all. Actually, uh, the plan itself specifically stated that Israel would have overriding zoning authority mm -hmm. over you know, areas east of the border, meaning you know, in Palestinian state, in, in, in areas close to the border, like, without defining what that means. But given you know, how narrow that strip of land is, that could have meant like maybe heartland of, of Ramallah, yeah. uh, zoning authorities. And, so basically, that's what we're looking at. What I'm telling you is that a lot has to change, you know, beginning with recognition of our right, formal recognition by the government of Israel of our right to a fully sovereign state on the territory Israel occupied in 1967. I call for that to be the starting point for negotiations if we're really serious about anything. This is not to say we'll not negotiate borders or any other aspects of statehood, but we need first, before we begin the process, a formal recognition of our right to it, every square inch of it. Yeah. That's what needs to happen. We offered Israel recognition of its right to exist in peace and security in 1993. It's about time for that circle to be squared. Okay. So I have many more questions, but yeah. I cannot leave this room alive unless I turn it over to the uh, audience. So I have, I'm going to take a couple of questions from my students. That By the way, I have time. No, I, I, and I, I, I suspect they will take all of the time that you have. Um, so the first person I have is Abhi uh, Rajkumar. Yeah. Um. Me and a few other students from the Kennedy School have just come back from a trip to Israel, including the Gaza border region and oh. parts of East Jerusalem. Um, one thing I found the most surprising was speaking to some Palestinian community leaders who spoke about um, the idea of a one-state solution where everyone simply lived with equal rights and equal access to opportunities. Um, and as an Australian, that sounds fantastic and ob obviously ideal, but I couldn't help but think in circumstances where that would, like you said, in relation to numbers, completely change the ideology of a Jewish state and a safe haven for Jewish people, 
Um, what's your view on that position and where do we go from here when there are so many leaders that still believe that that is possible? Yeah, um, great question. This has been the discourse actually for quite some time now with many not necessarily speaking or, or considering one state solution as a solution, but as a reality, as a reality. I mean, and, and that's the reality that has been unfolding for a number of years and not only over the past couple of years. Uh, it has been unfolding for a long period of time and you consider and look at what is happening on the settlement front, settlement expansion, the rest of it, how disjointed the West Bank has become, even in Gaza, you know, settlers moved out of Gaza back in 2005, as you know, but the settlements of the West Bank, if anything, and settler community, they have expanded substantially, as you well know. So that brought with it, in, in the progressive way, uh, a, a, a one-state reality that is not acceptable. It certainly is not acceptable, should not be accepted to us Palestinians before you know, we even begin to think about what that might look like from Israel's point of view. Um, so that's what we have unfolding before our eyes. Uh, it's not acceptable because we definitely are not full-fledged citizens in that one-state reality. Obviously, we're not. And, and that is really the, the agony. That's the kind of trap we find ourselves in, 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 in one important way. Because unless we somehow find a way to get out of the entrapment uh, that Oslo has ended up being, uh, unfortunately, we're going to be in that space. A weak Palestinian authority in, in the way that it is, it has been, and it, it will continue to be unless it is reconfigured politically and enabled politically, in a way uh, actually has turned into an instrument of disempowerment for us Palestinians before anyone else. Uh, because if you talk to for example, uh, Netanyahu or, 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 or someone else who they don't like the idea of Palestinian statehood, and you say, but then uh, look, you are an apartheid state, and say, you know what his answer would be? No, we're not. Your Palestinians have representation. Uh, they have a Palestinian authority. Look at it, looks like state. they have even passports, they have this, that, the other thing. So anyway, all that it is doing is, is, is providing a free service. Uh, you know, by continuing to be in, in the weak shape it is. However, to those who say it's an easy thing to really get out of this trap by dismantling, you know, the PA, I'd say think again. How, how can you possibly even do that? I mean, it has become so much intertwined uh, in, in, in Palestinian lives. Uh, can you really begin to imagine how difficult a task it is to undo it? I think the only sensible solution that is before us is to actually strengthen it. Uh, if it was meant to be weak so that it would not turn into a state by design and would end up being an instrument of disempowerment, I should, we should rebel against that. Mm -hmm. Not by dismantling it, but actually strengthening it to ensure that it can actually more transition to and, and, and transform itself into a state. Yeah. The idea of really staying in this position of weak, but not too weak to, fall, to, to, to completely fall and cease to be of value to Israel, but not ever strong enough to become a state, that's what we really should understand and we should definitely strive to strengthen it so it could become a state, de facto state, before it's so, so recognized. Um, the next person I have is uh, Nitsan uh, Mahlis. Hi, my name is Nitsan Maklas. I'm an MPP student at the Kennedy School from Israel. Mr. Fayad, you have argued for a reformed PLO to be expanded to include all major Palestinian political factions, including Hamas and Islamic Jihad. But by increasing power to such non-state actors without necessitating their disarmament, Israel would likely further delegitimize de the PLO as a future peace partner. How can the PA help incentivize the moderation of more extremist Palestinian factions? Uh, thank you. I'll answer this question. Can I add just like one sentence to yeah, what please, I said? Yeah, uh, I tell you something else we should avoid. That's one sentence. One, <laughs> sorry, sorry. That, that's introduction to the one sentence. We, we, we should avoid kind of falling in the trap of thinking just because the idea of a Palestinian state on the territory of Israel occupied in 1967 did not work imparts automaticity 
to the emergence of one state. That just, you know, it's, it's a recipe for inaction. So to just make, wait it out, all we have to do is just wait it out. Uh, that will be said, that's just not going to happen. So we should avoid thinking those terms as well. Thank you. Now on, on the question of uh, expanding the PLO and that, the possibility that, that actually might include impart, Hamas, Hamas include and everyone uh, imparting legitimacy to them, while at the same time rendering the PLO less than uh, an acceptable partner in, in a peace process to Israel. Uh, uh, the idea that I actually propose specifically says that neither side would impose its conditions on the other side within the PLO. In other words, the expanded PLO, my idea is basically, as it stands right now, the PLO cannot continue to say, the only way you can get in is by changing your platform to conform to mine. And at the same time, it is not accepting of Hamas, Jihad, or others to say, unless you change your platform, we would not join in. Basically, what this is, is a table that's large enough to accommodate everybody, regardless of their own factional, individual factional uh, 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 political programs. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is more or less the case within the PLO as it exists right now. It consists of factions, and not all their programs are identical. PFLP's program, for example, it's a member of PLO, is not identical to that of Fatah. Fatah's own platform is not consistent with the PLO's platform, by the way. Uh, uh, so, so this is something that can be accommodated. This is part of what I had meant when I said we need to find a way to effectively manage that pluralism. But the idea of trying to manage by exclusion is, I think, definitely short-sighted, and it cannot really lead us anywhere. We, we need to bring everybody, and, and, and there are some specific ideas as to how you can run that show, notwithstanding the differing views. And why is that? This is not really academic. Why is that? Because there is no solution in the immediate future. You know, if, if in fact, there a solution concept is being dangled as a possibility within the next year or two, I would say, okay, it's time for us Palestinians to make up our minds. Are we going to go right or left? But is there anybody in this room who thinks that, who thinks that that's realistic? To the extent it's not realistic, I say, why is it that we should continue to be divided over something that's not around the corner? Mm. So let us really at least agree on an agenda that is about self-empowerment. You know, build our own institutions, strengthen them, provide for the welfare of our people in the most competent way that we possibly can. You know, build the reality of that state, project the reality of said that, that, that we want, regardless of our differences as to the vision for, for, for an ultimate solution mm -hmm. or a solution that might ultimately be accepted. In the process, some transformation could occur. At some point during the process, maybe a solution could become more realistic. If and when it does, at that point, the leadership must say which way is it going to be. Are we going to go this way or that way? Maybe we can go to a referendum. We can. The idea of really wanting to ensure that all stars are aligned properly yeah. and ideally before we embark on a process of transformation is wrong. I think we should get on with it. We need to at least minimally commit everyone to one thing that is essential, nonviolence. Yeah. You know, there is a condition. So it's not like everybody gets in there with their own ideology and all of that. Everybody has to commit under this scenario to nonviolence during this transition. Everybody has to agree to it. And it's going to be comprehensive. It's going to be everywhere, not only in and around Gaza. Yeah. Everybody stands to benefit from this, yeah. for sure. And that certainly beats not doing anything. Uh, you mean the idea that Hamas would not be asked to give up on its uh, commitment to uh, 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 armed struggle, it's just you're saying to be part of this pact, they would have to give up on it temporarily. Yes. Is, that, is that realistic what it's, they do it's, that? It's, 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 uh, it's a time-bound commitment to nonviolence. It's yeah. hudna in Arabic. Yeah, it's yeah. hudna yeah. in Arabic. Yeah, like it's time-bound commitment yeah. to nonviolence. It is, it is a truce. It's something that actually is, is, is within what they actually exercise in practice effectively yeah. Yeah. in previous years. Yeah. And it's doable. Yeah. Look, I go for what what can be done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the ideals and you know the, the maximalist positions that everybody has is one thing. You need to understand, be aware of those. Yeah. But you ask yourself the question, this is about what is doable. Yeah, yeah. And this is the most we can accomplish. It's better than continuing to go to war. Yes, yes. 
it, it, it certainly beats the death, destruction, misery that people are going through. Why not do that? And there may be a way out, but that way out is not going to be perfectly engineered yeah. at the outset from now with all stars aligned completely perfectly. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll take a question here from uh, Farah uh, Kalach, and then, um, you know, you'll raise your hand. I will call on you. You'll ask a succinct and potent question. Uh, but first, Farah, please. My question is, um, do you think that a Palestinian... Can you, can you please speak up? Sure, sorry. Yeah, yeah. My question is, do you think that a Palestinian state based on the 1967 borders is feasible given a potential peace accord between Saudi Arabia and Israel? C can you please can, repeat? Speak I'll, I'll repeat it because yeah, I'm loud. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, it's a great question. So yeah. the question is basically, you know, Israel and Saudi Arabia are talking about normalizing with the, uh, 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 you know, the U.S. playing a, a very prominent role in that. What would be the impact of that normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia for the prospects of Palestinian statehood? Very good question, actually. And uh, it, it was asked when the process of normalization started, uh, yeah. beginning with countries that normalized before Saudi Arabia. It was in the process. That conversation was going on, and then we, we know what happened. Uh, I would have answered maybe differently at the start of normalization. My preference for sure would have been for us to stick to the original API concept as it was. Arab Peace Initiative. Arab, uh, API, did I say? Yeah, Arab Peace Initiative. That, that, that's what I meant, uh, as it was. Because the normalization in a way can really turn that you know, upside down. But then, you know, I'm a realist, it happened. So then you ask yourself, well, you would, you, you preferred for the Arab Peace Initiative to be the basis for engagement in, in normalization. And actually, that was normalization in exchange for Israeli... Yeah, yeah that was, that was, that was the whole idea. Yeah. Originally, Saudi, Saudi proposal uh, turned into uh, something that's agreed by all Arab countries in the spring of 2002, Arab Summit and, and, yeah. and all. Uh, you know, at the same time, I have to tell you that it, that thing was on the table for a very long period of time for nearly 20 years and produced nothing. Too bad it didn't. It should have, but it didn't. And I was thinking maybe something could have been done to turn that concept uh, that is embodied in, in the Arab Peace Initiative into a program of action. Meaning, you know, we do this, you do that. I mean, turn it from a simple, you know, withdrawal and occupation normalization into a, a program, just do something with it, because for it was sitting there that did yes, nothing. Yes. So I think it would be a little not, I would not be completely honest if I told you that I was happy with the state of affairs at, as it predated normalization, because we didn't get much of it. But in any event, we are in the day after. We are post-normalization, started to happen. Yeah. Now, clearly, Saudi Arabia is a very significant country, and you know, from Israel's point of view, it, it's substantial. And with that, Possibly the payoff that could come with that on the part of what, in, in, in terms of thinking, what Israel may need to think about or consider on the Palestinian front mm. to make the normalization deal possible politically and, and, and all of that productive. That's, that's constructive. I think this is, it, it gives us something to talk about, yeah. uh, as a matter of fact. But it actually puts especially a burden on us Palestinians. Palestinians to come up with a, a plan, a concept, as to what it is we expect. There are certain ideas that were put forward in, in general terms. Yeah. For example, an assured path to statehood. Now define that. I mean, it's, it sounds like a, a good something. An assured path to statehood. Uh, so, so we need to go a little bit beyond, you know, something like this. Uh, some ideas about, for example, oh, we recognize the state of Palestine. Uh, if, if there is recognition of the state of Palestine, then maybe, you know, Saudi Arabia could find it easier for it to engage and, or, or consummate, normalize, uh, normalize the relationship with, with Israel. We need to be careful with, with, with these things. What, what, what does it really actually mean? I mean, we, we have some 150 countries already uh, maybe uh, rec recognizing state of Palestine, which is fiction. Um, it's political fiction. I mean, where is it? Yeah. What, what yeah. is it we're talking about? Uh, can we, as a matter of fact, turn this into something that's more meaningful? Beginning, beginning with statement of recognition of our right to a state. Yeah. For example, I mean, if, if that 
if there is a, a president initiative uh, that begins to really actually put some elements together as to what might constitute a reasonable and, and realistic way forward yeah. and have that conversation with Saudi Arabia, I think Saudi Arabia is quite open yeah. to em, e, e, embracing a, a position like this, taking it to the table with Israelis. I'm all for being specific yeah. and, 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 and constructive about this as opposed to either formalistic and, and saying, oh, whatever the Palestinians agree, we agree with. Yeah. That's, that, to me, probably, you know, that's, that honestly is not good enough. Yeah. Uh, and or on the other hand, for us Palestinians to say, that's turning, you know, things on their head and it's not really a good idea and should be rejected and all of that sort of, you know, the train has left the station on that. The question is, what do you do to take advantage? And I think what we do, first of all, we really need to ourselves, you know, basically sketch a way forward for us that we all can converge on, have a conversation about that with Arab countries that have been actively interested in the Palestinian file, talk about Jordan, Egypt, you know, Saudi Arabia, some other countries, uh, include others, and then take that position to the Arab League and have that become, you know, the new pan-Arab initiative for projecting the Palestinian interests and representing the Palestinian cause internationally, including on issues of normalization. or Something like this, I think, would be an opportunity. So it sounds like, you know, you're saying that the normalizations that took place in the Trump administration, those may have been appropriately seen as vehicles that led to the, uh, for the bypassing of the Palestinian uh, 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 cause of, uh, of self-determination, but the Saudi-Israeli uh, normalization may be actually a vehicle for putting it back on the table. You know, the, 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 there's also something else. There is that, but there's also... And then I, 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 yeah, I'm there, call there, Very quickly, okay. there's also something else on this. Before, before the normalization that took place during the Trump administration, yeah. Israel was only presented or was looking at the promise of what could happen if it were to withdraw from territory that occupied in 1967, Arab yeah, territory, yeah. not only Palestinian. That, that the promise of what might come out of that. Uh, things change. When, with, when things change, there is a new dynamic now. Yeah. Israel is looking today at something different, or was up until October 7, looking at something different. I'm not saying that's not going to be recreated, but, but it was looking at something different. And now, post October 7, is still, the picture has changed. Israel is now looking at normalization that it has pocketed and normalization that it actually would like to have. So, so something that it has secured, something that it wishes to have. Mm. How secure is what it has secure? Mm. How likely is it going to be possible for that to be secure? or for example, to feel secure enough about that being permanent something. Mm. I don't know the answer to that question. I know mm. how countries that have normalized the question with Israel would say, yeah. would answer that question. But regardless of how they themselves would answer the question, yeah. is that kind of relationship uh, resilient enough yeah. to continue to withstand the political pressure and the mobilization that associated with the continued carnage, death, destruction, at the massive scale that's going on in Gaza, for how much longer is that going yeah. to really be the case? Yeah. Yeah. And this is, you know, countries that, and I have not included, uh, at least, or, or, or implied uh, uh, enough about other countries. Yeah. We, we, we talk about countries that normalized under, normalized under Trump administration, but there are two Arab countries that had peace treaties with, with Jordan with, and Egypt. Jordan and Egypt. And, and, and there are other countries. So, yeah. so there are regional ramifications yeah. to what, what's going on. Yeah. And all the more reason for there to really be much more preoccupation on the need and the importance, vital importance, of bringing this war to an end sooner than, yes. rather yes. than later. Okay, Let, let's take some uh, questions. So um, ho hold on, keep your hand up. So I'll start with um, Professor Nadia Hajj, but keep your hand up just so I can. Uh, okay, go ahead, please. Uh, we have a mic coming to you. Thank you. Um, I had a question about your vision of the Palestinian future. And post Oslo, I feel that the Palestinian communities in the Mukhayyams in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan have been forgotten. Uh, as someone that professionally studies the region and 
my family lives in Nahr al-Barid in most of these camps in Lebanon and Jordan and other places, the resounding phrase I hear is min'aish bidun amal. Min'aish bidun amal. Mm. We live without, without hope. hope. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, what is the hope? What is the amal here? For all these, the vast majority of Palestinians live outside of the West Bank and Gaza. What, what's the vision for them at this table uh, of a future Palestinian state? Great question. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are two dimensions to this. First, we, you, you made a reference to Oslo and what was agreed in Oslo. And what was agreed in Oslo was to have this issue settled in negotiations. The issue of right of return for no, refugees. No, not right of return. The issue of refugees. Okay. That's, that's the distinction I wanted to really make here. So that, that was something that was supposed to be resolved in negotiations. So some, the issue was negotiated, uh, definitely extensively. I was not there when, when, when it happened in, 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 in the course of the negotiations, certainly during the 90s and even after that. But, but that was discussed as, you know, arrangements, how many are going to return, not to return, compensation, there was that kind of discussion. But what is really important to understand is, is, and that's really part of weakness. That's when I, I made the reference to Edward Said, for example. Yeah. Uh, also did not address issue of Palestinian national rights at all. And if you ask me, and you would be right to react, any Palestinian leader in, in, in a position of power and authority, it's a fair question to ask. What is their definition when we say our national rights? You say national rights provided for under international law. Let me tell you how I define them. Uh, I begin with the right of return as provided for under international law specifically you uh, General Assembly Resolution 194. I, I can't, that's number one, right of return, because it, that's the essence of what the president calls is about. That's our right of return. Right to self-determination, including the right to a fully sovereign state on the territory Israel occupied in 1967 in its entirety, including East Jerusalem, that's it. That, that's how I do it. But I start with that, you know what I'm saying? So, as as a right of our people, I don't think we should really ever give up on that. And nor should we expect it to. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, this is language that is included in something that Mahmoud Darwish, Mahmoud Darwish is known as a poet, but he's a foremost political thinker. He actually, on the 50th anniversary of Nakba, wrote a, a most profound, politically speaking, uh, piece, uh, said, uh, message from Palestinian people. And he concluded by saying something to the effect that uh, there will be peace. Mazalat aydina tahmel al-jariha, tahmel aghsan al-zaytun al-yabas, our hands are kind of, etc. with, until Israelis grow up and recognize our national rights, as a people, and he counted them. And then he closed by saying, there can be no peace with the occupation, and there can be no peace between masters and slaves. Mm -hmm. I said, Sad wa Abid. I translated to kind of make it easier for the Western ear, there can be no peace between masters and surrog surrogates. Yeah. Uh, I think fundamentally, what is really required is a recalibration where humanness and humanity of, of Palestinians is recognized on par with everyone else. When our pain and suffering is so recognized as equal to the pain and suffering of any other people anywhere around the world, when we will get to the point when that is the case, I think peace will be within reach. And just as we would like to be seen that way and dealt with this way, we should also be of a mindset to actually accept that as a vision for all peoples around us and around the world. That's just the way words, it has to be. The suffering it, of it, others. To, yeah. that's, that, that, that's just how it goes. Yeah. We should not really be all always kind of put to the task of having to somehow prove that we are worthy of this, that, or the other thing. But you know, the struggle for that 
starts with us. Starts with us. We definitely should insist on, on parity. Parity is absolutely important. Yeah. When we really get to that point, I think other issues begin to really find resolution. That will take time. Uh, but that take, would take a lot of energy, determination, and, 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 and will, and, and leadership on, on, on our part, first and foremost. So, so um, I, we, we're running out of time, but I want to try to take two more questions. Can I just get to, sure. to ask them one after sure, the other, please. and then you can... Sure. So uh, I'll come to Ahmed and then Adam. Right here. And ask it briefly, and then I'm going to yeah, uh, answer. Yeah. Just a quick point on the, the Singapore talking point. I just... I think on the, the question of hope that is really important, I think, like Dr. Fayyad said, despite, you know, occupation and despite the siege, Gaza and the West Bank have higher literacy rates than Singapore. So that's one. But I think my, my question is, I think we've seen, you know, the, the staunch position that the U.S. has taken in the conference on October 7th. Um, if we do enter negotiations with Israelis, who should be the mediator? And who should help lead these talks between the Israelis and the Palestinians? Excellent. By the way, also higher literacy rate than uh, my home country of Egypt. Um, yes, Adam. And of U.S. probably. Yeah. Good evening, Dr. Fayed. Uh, Th thank you so much for being here. My name is Adam Satterfield. I'm a master's student. My question is about international aid um, and how that aid is di distributed. So uh, the, the Palestinian Authority receives a massive amount of international aid as a part of its economy. There's been persistent allegations that that aid has been misappropriated or misused. And so I'm curious, as both the finance minister, former finance minister and prime minister, uh, can you speak to those allegations? And uh, if those are not um, accurate, can you talk about some of the checks and balances that are in place to ensure that that doesn't occur? So, so two questions. One, who should mediate this, uh, 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 you know, uh, any kind of uh, final settlement or, or, or interim settlement between the Israelis and the Palestinians? And the other one is really about corruption, that you're, you know, you're saying, you know, we, you know, Palestinians should self-govern. He's saying, well, there's been a long uh, uh, record of corruption of people feathering their nests. Indeed, that might be what some of these factional rivalries are about, about the opportunity to feather nests. How do we overcome that yeah. problem? First of all, uh, I think in terms of history, well, we know how it happened. Uh, there was involvement, generally speaking, by the international community, but everybody understood that the key player in that was the United States and even other components of the international community, by the way, including Russia, for a good part of the period in the context of the quartet, were deferring to the United States in many ways because they felt that the United States was in a unique position to influence the way uh, Israel behaves, because ultimately Israel is supposed to give up territory, to see territory in order for there to be precedent set. So the U.S. had that kind of understanding, and it was seen as having it, and its other partners in the international community were not unhappy with it, because they themselves could not deliver. Meaning, for example, the EU could not get you know, from Israel what the EU itself thinks the U.S. may be able to get from Israel. So that there is that reality. So a legitimate question to ask is if the process failed, well, maybe, you know, given the nature of the intermediation effort in terms of the players who, who is doing it, maybe it needs to be reconsidered. And there is an argument for that. You know, and, but we, we need to think about like what that might mean, uh, something broader than the quartet. Word has changed in important ways. Uh, the process has kind of really started before the world became effectively uh, unipolar for about a decade and then started to shift away, you know, kind of multipolarity and all. So many things have changed. So you expand what was uh, a party of four or a group of four to a party of group of six, include other countries like, uh, for example, China, uh, like India uh, and all. But then you need a convener somehow. Uh, and I think everybody could have something to do. I think more important, more important than who does the intermediation is maybe the framework within which, is, uh, within which this is to happen and, and the basis of the process. Mm. I think what is really more important than who's going to really uh, be the manager, orchestrator, convener, uh, or mediator, the principles of it. Mm. Let's just really begin with clear definition of what the principles are because where we could go wrong is when we begin to think that what ought to be principles are to be negotiated. Negotiations ought not be about principles. They, they should be about arrangements. They should be about assurances, but not principles. 
an overriding principle from uh, my point of view for us Palestinians is to have our national rights as a people recognized. Yeah. We are the people to be excluded, marginalized, canceled in this. That's the nature of this hmm. enterprise from the, from the very beginning. So can we really begin this process by a clear and unequivocal statement of recognition by State of Israel of our national rights as a people? That's very important yeah. to, get, to really get the process going. And, and then, you know, less important is actually who does it, but I can see a process uh, that could really benefit from broadening it somewhat, but really I think it will be more important to focus on, on the substance of it and what goes into it by way of the principles and, uh, and deliverables. On, on, on good governance, poor governance, and, and, and misuse of funds and, and the rest of it, yeah, look, I, I'm a firm believer in, in, in the need for that to be focused of the, any government and some actually used to take issue with how obsessed I was with talking about good governance as if it's really priority under occupation. I say it's priority uh, everywhere and especially so, particularly when it becomes uh, a part of what you're expected to do uh, and overcome uh, if it's um, poor governance yeah. in order to somehow qualify. It becomes even a national duty. If ours is about liberation and if even however unfairly we became expected to have to pass that test to qualify for statehood, however unfairly. I think it'd be stupid of us not to really take that test and pass it yeah. to begin with. Now, uh, clearly that is not where we are. Where it is clearly that's not where we need to be either. Uh, but it's something that we really should accord highest priority to, uh, where I think the world could sometimes you know, go wrong and it's kind of really embedded and saying, you know, things like Singapore and why is it that, you know, we didn't become that as opposed to who we are today and all of that sort of thing. It's, you know, the idea is uh, we're too corrupt to, to, to manage, we're too corrupt to become a state, we're too corrupt to, yeah, you know, uh, uh, be the, the drivers of our own fate and shapers of our own destiny and, and all of that sort of thing. What if, if, if that's... If that's ever going to be a criterion, I can give you a very long list of countries that would immediately qualify for occupation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Dr. Salem, uh, thank you. There's, there's two things I, I want to say. The first is I said that to the extent I have a strong religious identity is as a Fayadist, uh, and I suspect that at the end of this uh, uh, 90 minutes, more than a few people have been converted to the faith. Um, so uh, welcome. Uh, the second thing I want to say is, you know, people at Harvard often talk about how extraordinarily privileged we are. And I think, you know, what we've uh, uh, seen today is that that privilege is not the, the beautiful buildings or the amazing food uh, or the tremendous professors. By the way, I was just being totally sarcastic about all of those. Um, but it's really about opportunities uh, like this one, the opportunity that we just had to be in communion with a mind that I think is not just a national treasure for the Palestinian people, but in fact is a global treasure. So please, everybody, join me in thanking Thank you. Dr. Salem Fengal. Thank you. Thank you.